Tonight in Washington state, the outbreak turning deadlier. It's led the news for the better part of the last two years. We have all shared the stories of the impact COVID has had on the health system, frontline staff, jobs, schools, the economy. But how have journalists who have stood at the front lines to broadcast those stories managed? We find out now coming up on the Morning Medical Update. Good morning, everyone. It is finally Friday. It's April 22nd. Thank you so much for joining us here on Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter. Coming up, a look back from the start of the pandemic until now, the past two years. Plus, Dr. Dana Hawkinson joins us with our COVID count and the latest headlines on the pandemic. But first, deciphering fact from fiction. They are the leaders in their newsrooms responsible for helping keep you informed as this pandemic rolls on. So how do they make those key decisions for coverage day after day? We turn the tables today and we get to interview the media. So get your questions sent into us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. But first, the CDC now looking into unexplained positive cases of hepatitis in young children. They are urging health departments, doctors, and parents across the nation to keep an eye out for symptoms in our children. Our medical director of infection prevention and control, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, joins us now. Good morning to you. Yeah, hi. Uh, first off, how unusual is hepatitis mm -hmm. In kids these are kids under the age of six mm -hmm. yeah I mean of course you know we know younger people are generally healthier um, hepatitis means uh, in inflammation or infection of the liver basically inflammation of the liver or liver injury um, it's pretty rare you know it does happen infrequently um, especially when we are talking about infection we know um, in the United States it's rare but we know in other countries there are viral forms of hepatitis, most importantly, um, hepatitis A and B in some of these other countries when we're talking about children specifically. So this is new and unusual. Um, we know that the cases first were identified in October 2021. Since that time, uh, they have identified more. We know that Europe has also identified a cluster of cases as well. So this is unique um, in the fact that Again, as I stated, we know that a couple of the viruses, hepatitis A and hepatitis B specifically for children is very important. All of these children were checked for those viruses. Those were negative, uh, but they are looking into another virus, which may be the cause, which would be unusual for these children, which who otherwise have really no underlying comorbid uh, conditions. So this is fairly unusual, and uh, we know that more information is forthcoming. So what signs should we be looking for? How do we make sure to keep our kids safe? Yeah, I mean, I think depending on um, what it is exactly, um, if we're talking about this specific virus that they have identified so far, it's adenovirus 41, and I think everybody has to understand there are many types of adenovirus. There are over 100 types that we've identified. Adenovirus 41 typically will cause a gastrointestinal type illness, um, possibly followed by respiratory symptoms. So things that you wanna look for would be uh, increasing abdominal pain, uh, maybe they are changing color uh, for what we call jaundice. So maybe they're getting uh, a little bit yellow in their eyes and skin. Um, but just things also like fatigue and malaise, they're really nonspecific symptoms. But you're going to be looking for those types of things, a progression rather than somebody who is getting better. All right. Thanks for that update. Yeah. We'll get back with you here in just a bit with yeah. some community questions and our COVID count. But a live look now inside the nerve center of this morning update. It's our control room. This is where we handle the video, the graphics, camera shots you see, the sounds you hear out on our podcast. So we want to say good morning to those guys. Bob, Anthony, Mike, Logan, thanks so much, guys, for doing what you do day in and day out. Our guests this morning have spent a lot of time in control rooms and newsrooms. Joining us in studio this morning is Sean McNamara. He is a news director at Fox 4 here in Kansas City. Great to have you, friend. Good morning. Good. Looking forward to visiting with you. Also joining us, we Zoom, we've got Matt Wagner. He is the news director at KSHB Channel 41 here in KC. Jesse Frey, news director at KSNT in Topeka. Natalie Davis, she is a reporter and anchor at KWICH in Wichita, Kansas. And you know their voices, Dana Wright, Scott Parks of Dana and Parks in the afternoons on KMBZ FM Radio. Good morning to all of you. So glad to have you friends. I guess I can call you friends now because we've somehow, <laughs> our, our paths have crossed some way or another throughout the last couple of years. So, so nice to have you all here. And I'm really looking forward to this 
conversation. Uh, just to give folks kind of an idea of how much TV that we've been watching during the pandemic, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics found on average people were watching or listening to TV or radio about three to five hours each day. Missouri, in fact, ranked in the top 10. So, Sean, Matt, Jesse, I want to start with you. You guys are leaders in the newsroom, and along comes this pandemic. So, Sean, I'll ask you, how did COVID immediately impact the work that you and your team was doing? Well, it, immediately it was a one, almost a one-day switch mm -hmm. of, oh gosh, how do we keep people safe? Um, I don't think any news director has ever been faced with a circumstance where the safety, the life of their coworkers was in their hands in a lot of ways. The decisions they make, the assignments they were put on. Uh, so we immediately went to having people in uh, separate vehicles so they weren't together, masking, um, you know, using uh, extension poles so that when they interviewed someone, they were outside the six foot uh, distance. Um, it was, and it changed all in about a day or two. Um, literally, of, I remember rushing to literally the Home Depot to buy paint poles <laughs> to, to extend microphones out to folks or to the race to find masks of any sort. Um, and, and literally, we actually found someone who sewed them for us. Uh, it, it happened like that. It was a quick pivot. Jesse, uh, what about you all there in Topeka with your teams? I mean, I mean, news teams, we were like family. You work so closely. You're so close knit. You're in news vans together. You're eating together, um, close talking and, and uh, sharing stories and information with each other. How did you guys manage? Yeah, and in a smaller room, uh, newsroom, I would say even a little bit uh, more challenging as we try to operate 24 hours a day. So in the beginning, in addition to the masks, you know, finding cleaning solutions and anything we could do to, to keep people safe, we quickly put up partitions between the desks, kept some people out in the field. And, um, you know, at the same time, we were all living it ourselves too. So we had to, you know, work and then go home and worry about our own mental health and that kind of thing. So uh, challenging, challenging time and things have, have certainly uh, gotten better over the, the last couple of years. Matt, same question to you. When was that light bulb moment? Things switched, you said something's different and we've got to jump into action. I think for a lot of us, this was the first time where we were running logistics on two different topics simultaneously, right? It was logistics about keeping our crew safe um, and logistics about how to get answers to our audience in real time when there was so much noise and misinformation out there. Um, we each had to weigh kind of the risks of uh, getting cameras to, to hospitals and medical experts uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and how do we do that with keeping our crews separated? Um, just like a lot of other businesses, I think uh, there was an onus upon uh, leaders of, of each newsroom to really uh, look at remote options unlike news had before. Um, and then additionally set up systems where uh, we were consistently able to get access to the experts who had the answers that everybody wanted. So um, as Sean mentioned, I mean, I, I remember the Saturday uh, OP case that, that changed everything. I remember getting managers on the, on the phone and saying, okay, everything's about to change. How are we going to get through the next 12 hours, 24 hours? Um, and, and then we really um, didn't stop that mentality for, for about a year. Um, or, or longer than that in some instances. So um, there's nothing like it in our industry. It was, it was completely unprecedented. It was, it was. This update, in fact, really began to help to meet your all's needs of, of the media. You had daily questions that you were bringing to us. Kind of, you needed us for the information, the accurate information day to day, but we needed you guys to make sure that all this information was getting out accurately and in time so that we could protect our community. Um, you know, the, it impacted the way we connected with you. We love having you all come into our hospital and, and share our stories, but we just were unable to do that. Um, did you feel, uh, Sean, just the, the relationships with the people that you would normally be able to pick up a phone and call and walk into their building and talk to? I mean, it, it was hard to reach people to tell those stories. How'd you do it? It was, and, and again, it was remote circumstances like this, um, be it uh, the morning update here or Zoom or Teams or Skype or any other video conferencing. Uh, really changed that dynamic. In the past, we hadn't used those as much. 
Uh, and this really kind of made all of us kind of get over the technological challenges of those to say this is a way to reach people and to get voices, additional voices into our newscast that we weren't able to get by going in person, which has always been a, a, you know, part of TV. We have to go in person to talk to somebody. And uh, this was the first time we didn't have to go in person to talk to people on a daily basis. We made it work. Zoom, the Zoom interview yeah. was born. Dana, jump in here because we know TV, news business, it's like anything else. It's competitive. Um, but this wasn't about getting exclusives. This wasn't about being first. This was about being accurate and making sure everybody was on the same page. Sure. Um, t talk us through, you know, you've been in the news business, you're on radio. I want to know what what were your listeners saying in those first days? What kind of questions did they have um, for you guys? It was just terrifying. And in fact, when you guys asked us to do this, you know, you start looking back at the last two years, it was a very, very scary time. And our show is interactive. It's four hours live news talk a day. Um, we, we joke that Dr. Dana Hawkinson became like the fourth member of our show <laughs> uh, because information was coming in so fast and it was changing so fast. And we had a real obligation to kind of help facilitate sorting out fact through fi fiction. And this is before everything became political. I mean, people were dying in real time. We were seeing the numbers at KU and other facilities. And um, it was, we had the challenges that, 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 that you guys all mentioned in, in your newsrooms. I remember there was one day, my husband is a television news anchor. He was doing a five o'clock live report from our basement, I was trying to do the live show from up here in the living room, and we both got kicked off. Um, we, we had to upgrade our um, our uh, Wi-Fi strength in the home just to figure it out. And I think like a lot of us, we were figuring it out in real time, but while also acknowledging the urgency of getting factual information and answering people's questions to the extent that we could, um, with kind of you guys as a partner along the way, certainly in those early days um, when there was so much confusion and fear. Right. I mean, you all, we consider you all partners as well. We needed you big time. And Scott, same thing. I mean, when you have callers calling in and they're needing answers, I would imagine there's, um, you know, kind of, you, you don't know all the answers. And and I think people look sometimes to the media to have those answers on hand and, and to bring that comfort and, and tell them it's going to be okay. How did you manage? Well, I, I think, and this uh, Dana and I have said this from day one, there's nothing wrong with saying these three simple words, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, they, they seem to almost be, you know, sacrilege in, in media sometimes, but in the beginning, we simply didn't know. And, you know, not to uh, to Dr. Hawkinson's horn too much, but I mean, we, we <laughs> ended up going to him uh, almost every day because we didn't know, but I, I just wanted to follow up on something that Matt had said just a moment ago. It was, it was incredible to watch in real time uh, the dis slash misinformation that came out in the beginning of this pandemic and trying to counter that with factual science-based information uh, was almost a, a daily chore, if not a daily chore. Natalie, you sit on the desk, you're the face there at KWITCH at your station. Um, what kind of questions were you getting from people and how were you managing your job day to day, knowing that people were looking to you for accurate truth? Absolutely, I think that um, this was a time when journalism has never been more important. Um, this, is, this is the most important I feel our job has ever been because when has this happened in history? And um, people were turning to us and it wasn't just about their health information, their their fears for protecting their family, but people were losing their jobs. People were not getting the money they needed for unemployment. People were wondering, what do I do with my kids? School just shut down. I remember that was the moment that it became very real for me was when the governor announced kids aren't coming back from spring break. Um, and, and the very next day we came up, we had an entire newscast focusing on just answering parents' questions about what to do, childcare and protecting their kids' health and masks. I mean, it, it's just been really intense. And, and to echo what Scott said, I think it has been a rolling process of just trying to keep up on it, trying to sort through the fact and fiction and also trying to um, take strides through all of the political uh, noise that was added into this mix, creating it, making it really honestly quite difficult to do our jobs at times. Yes, uh, the uh, political noise. <laughs> Let us not forget that for sure. You make a good point though, Natalie. I too, I would sit here and I always say I'm so lucky because I get to sit 
on a table with doctors every day during a pandemic. So I had this advantage of, of being a parent myself and having questions and, and concerns. So when I was asking them questions, those were questions from a mom and a concerned mom in real time. So again, just goes to say that we were all, you know, navigating this at the same time. Um, I want to get to a community question. We have some coming in this morning. And um, David from Tonganoxy actually has a question for Dana. Uh, what was the moment that you first knew that this quite possibly was going to be one of the biggest stories in your career that you covered? Well, we were live on the air when they shut down the Big 12 tournament at mm -hmm. the Sprint Center. And, you know, we're having conversations on the air in real time, trying to sort this out. And then we're having conversations off the air, um, sometimes using language we could never use on the air. Because when that happened, and I know Scott will echo this, we were sitting in that studio. I've been covering this town for 20 years. And I said to Scott, we're in trouble. We're mm -hmm. in trouble. If they have just shut down a multi-billion dollar um, and, and this was right after, on the heels of the NBA, I think, suspending a game. I, I remember I was frantically texting my friends at the Sprint Center, and I said, are you really clearing out the Sprint Center? And so, you know, we're trying to keep focused and give everyone the information as it's coming in, but I've got four children at home, and I, I just remember the fear and trying to balance getting the information out in a timely manner, just what was happening around Kansas City. But then also, you know, we all have our sources texting people and saying, what is going on here? Like, is are we sure this is what they're saying it is? And that was a very terrifying day. I'm, I'm going to use that word. It was, it was terrifying. I, yeah. Who shuts down basketball? <laughs> I just remember thinking, in this, this city, is, this is real. It, it really, it was, you say it, it was terrifying because it, it, we, we kind of joke that it was about sports, but when you shut down sports in this city, it, it says a lot. I had a friend who flew in um, from Waco with, with Baylor and she landed and 12 hours later, Baylor called her and said, you are on the next plane home. We need you back here now. We don't want you to get stuck there. And I thought, what? That's ridiculous. I go call them. I mean, you're not going to get stuck here. And sure enough, she packed her bags and went, left my house and headed to the airport. It was just it was just something you had never been through before. Jesse, uh, just in a few words, can you remember just what, I know Big 12 is usually what comes to mind when people say, what was that moment? But any moment that sticks out for you when you knew this was this was it? Yeah, my corporate boss was in town and we were having dinner and they started shutting down the first games and it that, that was crazy. And then, you know, one thing that we were trying to do, we were with the governor every day for her news conferences and in the same fashion, trying to do that in a safe way and just get information uh, constantly. So definitely unprecedented. Um, we'll never see anything like it, I, I hope. <laughs> you hope, yeah. It, you're right there in the hub in the capital of our state. Sean, what do you remember? Uh, it really was Big 12, mm -hmm. was that moment. Yeah. It, it was that all of a sudden everything had changed. And by the next day, you know, we people were not in person. We were trying to figure out how to do things remotely. And... Um, you know, having, I think, in every newsroom and every business everywhere, meetings of what do we do to keep people safe? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you think back to the early, early days of the pandemic, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what to keep safe. We didn't know how virulent it was and how spreadable it was and what exactly spread it. Um, and what uh, was of concern and not of concern. It was crazy You just didn't time. know how yeah. big of a deal it really was. You, and yeah. I think in the news, you don't want to oversell it, that it's something bigger than it is. And so you're trying to really mm -hmm. keep it at a, a, at a level that's, yeah that's reasonable and factual. Um, well, we cannot talk uh, to our media friends without bringing in Dr. Hawkinson, because you're right, we've kind of turned him in, guys, to our, our new favorite uh, news reporter, as we know. Dr. Hawkinson, yeah. let's get to the COVID count first, yeah. and then I'm gonna ask you a few questions as well. Okay. Yeah, so right now, um, still in the single digits, nine active infections, two in the ICU, one on the ventilator, 16 in that recovery period. Um, hopefully this isn't a trend. Again, we know uh, cases have been increasing around the nation. We know that hospitalizations um, this week, we have seen increase in the nation. Mostly that's probably due to the uh, Northeast, but hopefully we won't see a large surge or a significant increase in overall uh, active infections coming to the hospital in the next week and over the weekend. All right, Dr. Hawkinson, you went yeah. to med school for a long time. You yeah. did not go to J school. This experience thrust mm -hmm. you into mm -hmm. a necessary role on mm -hmm. air. How did that truly feel for you? 
you know, when it first began, it was just about um, reciting what I had learned and what I understood about uh, about COVID-19, about the virus. Uh, you know, I had previously done some other uh, interviews about different infections uh, throughout the year, influenza, tick-borne illness. Um, and then it really just became, like we've heard from our guests, just this huge snowball that continued to roll down that hill. And so it really became uh, continually keeping up with the information and it is hard work and continuing to be updated. But really that is the mission really here of University of Kansas Health System in coordination with the University of Kansas Medical Center because I do have an appointment with them as well. It's that mission to educate, but this mission to educate now, it expanded from students and residents and fellows and other physicians now to the general public. And it's really difficult to do that medical and science communication when you're dealing with such complex issues. Mm -hmm. It's not just black and white. We've learned that now, especially when we're talking about boosters or therapies, uh, long COVID, any of those issues are, are complex. And so it's really um, taken a, a turn for that but really trying to be concise, but also clear to the general public about those complex issues in that medical and science communication. I used to say, if you could, if you could break it down to where someone like me can understand, yeah. then I think everyone else could. But that's not always easy. You have, a, you're very smart, and you have doctors speak, so you have to make it so we can all understand. Um, you and I always talk about the story about when yeah. we first. Uh, you know, COVID first came into our lives was mm -hmm. when I received a couple of phone calls from our local media reporters yeah. saying, are you familiar? Do you have somebody who could talk to us about this virus that's in China? It's supposed to be coming to the United States. I text you and I said, are you familiar with this? Of course you were. And you came down and we invited the media in to talk about it. Um, so it's just kind of going back to those early days, but you've really become kind of a name, a voice during this pandemic that so many people have relied on. But how has the pandemic changed you? Has this changed the way um, you see patients and you feel mm -hmm. about patients or just personally, how has it changed you? Um, it hasn't changed the way I see patients, you know. I, I felt extremely bad. Again, I go to that one patient early on in the pandemic who was in the nursing home and she came in with respiratory failure and just asked, what can you do for me? At that point, I couldn't do anything. Um, but now we have therapies, outpatient therapies. We have vaccination to help prevent all of those things. And if we can do those optimally, we can help prevent much of the tragedy that has already occurred. How has it changed me? I mean, I think it's changed everybody. I think it's changed the outlook. I think um, the isolation, all of that. Now, although it's gotten better, we have just seen changes. I think just more stress, things of that nature. You know, I was running around Loose Park yesterday and noticed the blossoms in the tree and just remember what it was like two years ago to be doing that. And, you know, the first shutdown was like two weeks. Everybody was pretty happy. And then after that, you could start to feel the general public um, started to, to lose, uh, lose their stomach for that and wanted to get back to normal. And so it's been a long time since that time, and we still haven't gotten back to normal, although it's been better. Um, it still is much different than it was pre-pandemic. So I think uh, that was a pretty uh, interesting thought I had yesterday, just going around uh, and that reminding me of what the time was like two years ago and to where we are now. So. Well, we think you've been doing a pretty darn good job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, I try. <laughs> you did a good job. All right, any other reporter questions on the line today? Well, if you are just joining us, we are in studio here with Fox News Director Sean McNamara and joining us via Zoom is Matt Wagner, News Director at KSHB Channel 41, Jesse Frey, he's the News Director in Topeka at KSNT, Natalie Davis, Reporter and Anchor at KWICH in Wichita, and of course, radio hosts, you know their voices, Dana Wright and Scott Parks from Afternoons on KMBZ FM Radio. So we're talking about COVID-19 and how the pandemic has impacted these members of the media during the last couple of years. Um, Jesse, let's uh, head out to you. So how were things in the newsrooms with the employees being in the station or having to work from home? I know there's a lot of camaraderie when it comes to newsrooms. Did, did it change the dynamic? Uh, you know, how did you pivot quickly and, and then talk about bringing people back in? Yeah, one of the things that we tried to do was uh, to just provide information and not scare people. And so in doing that, we really tried to normalize as much as possible the look of what we were putting out. So while we separated anchors on the desk, we never, fortunately, we never had to go to a remote situation. Um, and we kept our reporters out in the field. And, um, you know, just so we kind of had some backup forces in case the bug was to go through the station. We brought 
people back about a year ago and have just maintained uh, safety standards. We've only put our anchors back together on the desk about a month ago. And so uh, again, just providing uh, as normal uh, as possible of a, of a scenario for viewers was important for kind of keeping the calm is, is how I, I felt was important. Natalie, how is it for you? Uh, we rely on our colleagues in the newsroom to support us and certainly during a pandemic that never needed more. How, how did you manage that? Well, it was quite the learning curve. I think I'm really proud of our morning team. I'm the morning anchor for KWCH and um, we really led the charge on effective communication as we were all spread out between here at the station and then producers working from home. Um, I was one of the people who stayed at the station kind of leading, uh, steering, steering the ship from the station, but we had um, you know, on air folks who were reporting from home, we had reporters who didn't enter the station for on end. Um, you know, as Sean mentioned, going out to buy pink sticks, we had little mop handles for our microphones to try to create the distance. So it, it really showed us our flexibility, which we are flexible in our roles anyway. I mean, we're turning news of the day as it happens on very, very tight deadlines. And this really stretched us beyond, I think, something um, we ever could have imagined. I did have to go remote a couple of times, and I'll tell you it's challenging when you've got little boys at home who want mommy's <laughs> attention and wonder why they can't, you know, play while I'm on live TV. That, that made for some interesting television. <laughs> I think we're all along with you, barking dogs and screaming kids. It was just kind of the sound of the time for sure. Uh, Dana and Scott, did this change your guys' relationship there in the, in the radio studio? I always think of you two kind of just hanging out in there um, and, and doing your job. But when you had a pandemic in this, like you said, terrifying time, did that, did that kind of help forge your work bond? Scott, you want to go first? Um, sure. Uh, the, the only thing that's really changed uh, now, two years after the fact, is that Dana and I in studio, it looks more like I'm dealing with a bank teller because we did put up a partition in our studio between the two of us. Uh, but in, in, the, in the very beginning, it was, you know, as so many others have commented, it, there was so much that we didn't know. Dana and I were both sent home uh, in the beginning for several months. And I remember because we didn't know anything really about the virus, we had to create a whole new way of doing the show, a system behind the scenes to the point where I would drive to the radio station and we had a tree where our producer would leave all of the show content paperwork next to the tree and I would get out of my car and after he had gone back in the building and get the paperwork from underneath the tree. I mean, simple things, <laughs> bizarre things like that. But, um, you know, as far as the relationship between Dana and me, uh, you know, it's always been strong and I don't think and it, I don't think a virus is going to threaten that. Yeah, not it was the just partition. challenging. Like, I, and all you guys on the Zoom here know this: it um, to do a live interactive talk show from three different locations. I, I don't even like looking back on it. We hated it. We hated uh -huh. it. We were home three about three months, um, and then we we sort of ended up demanding we be allowed back in. And I said, I'll stay in a different room. Right. Scott can be in another room, but but. To do an interactive show from different locations, it's just not the same when you're not in the room. I mean, there's dialogue yeah. and there's like like anyone listening, you would have a conversation with your spouse or with a neighbor. It's different when you are not in the same location and then going to breaks and there was an echo. Yeah. And it for a live interactive talk show for four hours a day, um, it was not the it was not ideal. We got through it. Um, I never, ever want to go back to that time. <laughs> it stresses me out just thinking about it. Well, it breaks. Um, the, it for, breaks for a lot of you, too. Well, and you rely on that chemistry. I mean, I think that's what carries the show through for hour after hour and the chemistry with your with your colleagues and certainly with the viewers and that connection. So I, I bet it was a mess, but we all made it through uh, Matt curious. Um, it's, it's stressful as a news director, but you add in the pandemic and home and being away from home, even just being outside um, and away from the studio, I'm sure felt kind of like a respite um, for many. But um, uh, what kind of impact did COVID have away from work for you? I think it was and you know, our entire newsroom and everybody uh, on this panel can relate to the idea of the new cycle never stopping during COVID, right? Um, but we were living it in so many different ways. When, when we got the updates from Dr. Hawkinson every morning, it was as much for our families and our audience as it was for our newsrooms. 
So we're experiencing this as consumers as well as as um, news leaders. Um, I think you know there was um, a real challenge about fatigue when it's nonstop. But I also know that this was an opportunity. And, and going back to what what Scott had mentioned, the opportunity was to get factual information to audiences every day consistently and make sure that we were a source, a, a dependable source, no matter what was happening. I think that was one of the great values of this of this call is it was a built in system that we could rely on no matter what headlines happened the night before, where we could get facts about how it impacted our local community. And at our core, that is the most important job uh, that all of us undertake. So um, yes, yeah, certainly there was uh, a, a lot of stress during that period, just as there was for everyone, everyone. But I also think many of us embraced the opportunity um, to provide potentially life-saving information to our audiences day in and day out. Look, I, I think still um, we've seen a lot of attrition in the industry during this period, right? We've seen turnover um, because of, of the level of stress. Um, I think, you know, as much as anything, creating good cultures in, in our newsrooms and, and, and good cultures for interaction, even when people are going live from, from their bathrooms where they've set up a temporary studio, um, that was a, another challenge that we all faced. But um, certainly, you know, the, everything else was negotiable. What was non-negotiable was being there for our audience each day really well said, which is what I wanted to mention. Just all of you on this panel, all of the reporters out there. I mean, that is what really helped us, what we said months and two years ago, bend the curve. I mean, in the beginning, this was about how do we not become New York? We were sitting here in the middle of our country watching all of these other states suffering and uh, people dying. And we thought, you know, how close is it coming in? And Dr. Stite sat here day after day saying, we've got to bend the curve. And, and everyone coming together and setting competition aside is really what helped us do that. I mean, here at the hospitals, I mean, we bring all of our CMOs together on calls. It's not about competition. It's about everyone getting on the same page and getting our viewers and our community all the right, correct, accurate information. Sean, were you able to turn it off when you would go home at night or was it just 24 hour cycle for you? No. I I think you have to turn it off. Um, you know, for me, it was an interesting experience. I had just moved to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. My family was in another state. So, uh, and the, the planned move got delayed by the pandemic. So um, I had the experience of, of uh, worrying about people elsewhere, which yeah. was not unlike a lot of folks who were worried about family and friends they couldn't see on a daily basis. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things, it every newsroom has introverts and extroverts, as does everyone in life. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic played to different things. For the extroverts, it was very tough to go without that interaction with people. For the introverts, some of them actually enjoyed working remotely. Um, and it took us a little bit to convince them to come back to that environment. They were like, it was so quiet. It was great. Um, and so it is, we really got to learn, I think, a lot about each individual person. One of the things that, that we learned about our staff was there wasn't one simple solution for everything, that each person wanted a different level of comfort, a different level of safety that they were comfortable with. And so as we started to do things, we learned that a one size fits all didn't fit, that some people were comfortable being together as long as they knew more about the other person. Other people weren't comfortable being together and letting both of those exist um, was the way we got through it. Yeah, want to tell stories, you gotta let them do what works for them yeah. during this time. I want to get to some community questions, and Barbara has one right now. How did you handle the growing distrust of mainstream media that some displayed as the pandemic lingered? I'm throwing that out there. Who wants to go first on that one? I'll be going. Nobody. I knew oh, it was going to be. Just, why did I know it was going to be Dana? I had this strange feeling. Oh, well, Scott and I are in a little bit of a different. Um, we, it's a little bit of a different beast because we are now uh, opinion-based, factual news talk. Um, so we were able to throw our opinions out there, and when somebody was acting like a fool, we could say it. Um, and, and everyone else, um, because of the nature of the business, did not have that, I, I would call that a luxury during the pandemic. The only thing we could do was fight back with facts. Um, I, I had a friend on the front lines in charge of dispatching nurses to Brookdale in New York, um, she was working with nurses traveling all the time in the hot zones in the beginning. 
And she would come home at night and just collapse crying and would say, people are dying. They are dying in front of us. They are dying in front of these young nurses that are, are burning out, that, that went to go help, and there's no one to help. And so I think Scott and I were in a unique position to be able to kind of off the cuff tell all of those stories in real time when, when all of the deaths were happening um, and to try and keep politics out of it. And, and we said this a thousand times, this virus doesn't care who you voted for. It doesn't. Oh. Um, please follow the rules, please mask, please help in the curve. Um, and I'm, I hope that we were able to combat that because of the freedom that we have to kind of say what we're thinking in a way that um, the, the television stations were not able to do. Matt, your thoughts on that? Dana said it really well. Um, you, the facts are what drove our conversations. Now, uh, we didn't we didn't have the uh, luxury, as she put it, of, of being able to call out um, when when people were neglecting those facts at the rate that that was occurring. Uh, but certainly, um, fact checking was a necessary step for each claim about COVID um, and continues to be a necessary step, right? Uh, that conversation hasn't, hasn't stopped. Um, the beauty of our situation and especially um, having the direct line to medical experts um, is that um, we accumulated those relationships and the sound bites um, where we could fact check in real time um, based on what people were saying. And, and, and I will say this, um, whenever there is that degree of noise on, on social media, you, you have to recognize what people are seeing. So we tried to recognize that, okay, you may have heard this. Um, we took that question directly to the experts on this subject, and here's what we have found out. So it was taking those questions that everybody might have and utilizing the access we have to the people who are on the front lines, um, who are living this every day and saying, does this check out? Um, but, but misinformation is, is um, traveling at a rate that I think is, is surprising to all of us. So it wasn't something we could do one day. That was something that was required for us to do day in and day out as a, a pillar of our coverage. Natalie, similar question, and I, and I think Dana mentioned it with her friend who's working on the front lines. I mean, seeing is believing. And when you're seeing something devastating, but you're not seeing it right here in your backyard, it's sometimes hard for viewers to connect to that and really understand it or believe it, if you, if you will. So how did you push through, push back through the politics of it, the noise, as we say? Um, how did you manage that? Yeah, I mean, dealing with the politics was incredibly frustrating when it became wearing a mask is a political statement, like wearing a Republican or a Democrat T-shirt. I mean, it was incredibly frustrating. And of course, social media doesn't help. But what pushed us with our coverage was having our viewers backs and making sure that they understood that everything we were telling them was to help them, whether it was protecting their health but and backing that up course with expert evidence um, or you know how to deal with the schools closing how to deal with getting your unemployment benefits that you need I mean I think just demonstrating proof of performance here showing viewers that we cared about them and we knew what they were going through and that we're also with them I mean I wasn't alone in being affected by the pandemic this is my community too my husband's an orthopedic surgery resident and you would think that uh, being in the medical field you're not going to be impacted by the pandemic you're an essential worker right but I mean, all of his uh, elective cases got canceled, and so that affected his training. We're all in this together, and I think it was really important to not just be that neutral news presence, but connect with people and show them, hey, we're humans too. We're going along through this with you at the same time. Well said. Jesse, Isaac has a question. As far as new tactics that you adopted, which ones do you plan on sticking with going forward, and what might return to normal? Well, again, we've tried to keep it pretty normal, but obviously, as Sean said earlier, Zoom interviews and figuring out the technology as we're doing here today uh, has become so easy uh, to do live interviews via Zoom and that kind of thing. So I think some of that will definitely stick around. And then we in the uh, news industry, we have a lot of editorial meetings where we all come together to talk about ideas and what, what's on people's minds to determine what stories to pursue every day. 
And we generally did that in a small conference room and we expanded that out to doing that virtually also so people could participate on their cell phones. And we've since just brought those meetings back to the newsroom. So we're spread out um, and talking amongst ourselves in person so we can relate to one another and that kind of thing. Slowly but surely returning to normal. Sean, are you getting rid of the uh, broomstick microphones? Uh, you know, sometimes, actually, we find out sometimes they were helpful. <laughs> right? <laughs> they were, actually, we might, yeah. depending where you are, who you're yeah. interviewing, those actually might be pretty handy. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things you'll see, and I think I think a, a lesson learned is we would all, you know, as, as TV reporters, folks would come together, close, tight group around someone, mm -hmm. and that's allowed people to do that a little more distantly and a little more safely, even now. Um, even without masks um, being required now, I think there's still a concern about keeping some personal space between everyone so some of that stuff's going to stay i think I, it's funny I, i'll go back and I, I see old footage of me on the news desk and i'm like oh my gosh i'm sitting why am i sitting so close to that yeah. person I, I feel like i'm sitting on their lap it's crazy um i i'm going to ask you this sean and then if, if someone on our panel virtually wants to answer this i think it's just an interesting question uh, joellen wants to know if you kind of a back to the future question <laughs> what do you think news media from the past you could pick one or the other the past or the future maybe the past might do differently or might have handled it or would have said had they have gone through this based on maybe the way things used to be? I, you know, I think I was thinking about this concept as you're talking about this, and I think it's the media, I think it's society. Um, this pointed out that science is not exact and perfect, that we don't know everything on the front end. This was a disease that we learned about over time. Um, the modern world's taught us that things were very convenient, that we knew all the answers, that science could solve everything. And this virus taught us that we didn't know everything initially and that we had to learn about it. The problem was that created an expectation in folks that we were going to know all the answers up front. And when things changed or evolved, they said, well, see, they didn't know all the answers, so we can't believe anything. And I think if we had in introduced more questioning, more we don't know all the answers from the get-go mm -hmm. rather than saying we know everything, I think people would then have understood a little better the process of, of learning about a virus. That's a really good point. Anyone on the panel out there want to chime in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we've learned a lot more about just the medical process here. I think journalists, not historically really into math, uh, have gotten better <laughs> used to fix and how to deliver those in a digestible way for viewers. I think that was a big learning curve for everybody. But then, yeah, just acknowledging that, you know what, the facts can change. It doesn't mean that what we said prior was a lie or a political statement or wrong. It just means that this is an evolving situation. And I think it's um, it's changed uh, how we view our job. And um, it's not always black and white. Sometimes it's evolving. You're right. Yeah, not good at math and not good spellers. Is that fair to say? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get told that a lot. Okay, so um, some great questions from our community today, but I wanna ask a last question to everyone. And again, just thank you so much for uh, joining us. It's so nice to finally get faces with names as we've all been text messaging each other and emailing each other throughout this pandemic. Uh, so the last question, of, and it's hard to do in about 30 seconds or so, but what has covering this pandemic taught you just even personally or through your career, uh, your profession? Has it changed you in the way you tell stories? Dana, I'm gonna start with you. Um, it's, it always comes back to the critical importance of the free flow of information. Um, and we're seeing the devastating effects um, of the opposite effect in Ukraine right now. And so people love to beat up on the media and I say, man, you wouldn't want it any other way. Look at what's yeah. happening with the misinformation in Russia where you have people saying, I, I don't think there's a war going on. Um, and, and I think the pandemic looking back taught us the critical importance of that free flow of information, even when when we had to work hard to cut through the noise and, and the politics that entered the arena that is still just astounding. And I think people will look back in a hundred years and say, what the heck were they doing? Uh, but, but it is critically important that we have the system that we enjoy in the United States of America. And I think this pandemic brought that home for all of us. And I hope for our listeners and our viewers, um, even if you're, you're not a huge fan of the media, Man, during this time, uh, and the numbers bear this out, people were craving information, um, and, and we handled the responsibility of trying to provide that very seriously, um, and, and I hope that my, I think I know that my colleagues would, would agree on that. You said it. 
Journalists, we can take a beating and we just keep, we keep, we keep swinging, coming back. Natalie? Journalism is more important now than it has ever been. I think the pandemic showed that to us. I, I echo what Dana said, that we have to continue good journalism and getting the facts out there and supporting our viewers, our listeners, our followers, um, because where else would they get that information? We have access like the general public does not have. Journalism is so important. We need good journalists. All right, Jesse, final thoughts. Well, one fact, uh, we looked back at our rundowns after 9-11, and it was 15 days before 9-11 was not mentioned in some capacity in one of our newscasts. And now we cannot say the same about COVID. Every day for two years, the words coronavirus, COVID come up every newscast every day. And so to me, this has just proven the importance of, of journalism, pushing back when we hear things that might not seem quite right and just being there for the public and getting answers to their questions. Scott, how, is, how has this changed you or what has it taught you? It's taught me that it, it's very easy to be critical of the media. It is very uncommon or difficult to critically examine what you're getting from the media. And this is not an original thought because I don't have those, but everybody is certainly entitled to their own <laughs> opinions. Not everybody is entitled to their own facts. Well Amen. said. Golf claps from Natalie on that one, for sure. <laughs> Matt, what has this taught you? How do you move forward? I think my colleagues have done a, a great job um, explaining this experience. I'll also add one thing. What brought stories home was the community's willingness to share what they were going through. And we were asking something of them during a really difficult period as well, right? Be that from, from frontline workers um, to just parents trying to navigate how to take care of their kid and work remotely. Um, as I look back, I'm incredibly grateful for um, so many community members being willing to share those stories because it was a shared experience, mm -hmm. um, because it made people feel less alone to know that they weren't the only ones facing these challenges. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think um, that we, we had to go back to the to the root of, of what journalism should be, facts and storytelling. Um, and that's real people telling their stories um, and us delivering them in a way where, where others can learn from them um, or not feel so alone during a, an incredibly troubling time. Facts, truth, compassion, it all comes into play. Sean? You know, Matt hit on this, and for Fox 4 and the way our station is built, we're all about community and about being involved in the community. And the pandemic was a moment where not only were we reflecting the community, but we were often the gathering spot where you mm -hmm. couldn't gather with friends or neighbors and other people and talk about things. Um, our newscasts were where they were doing that, where they were interacting and through social media, through participating in things like this in the morning. Um, <clears throat> it, it reinforced, I think, the importance of being involved in your community, reflecting them, listening to them. We held town halls where they could voice their opinions about what was going on and learn things. Um, that became so obvious during the pandemic that community was, was the core of what we do. So Kansas City comes out stronger on the end of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for everyone being with us today. Like I said, it's nice to see I, my fellow friends in journalism. And um, Dr. Hawkins, and I want to give you a final yeah. thought as, yeah. as, as our um, medical journalist. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I just remember when we actually, you and I, Jessica, went to Fox 4, and then mm -hmm. I think the shutdown really happened pretty much after that. Uh, but I, I would like to thank the media in general because we know, for the most part, these uh, the media sites, uh, whether it's print or, or Internet or uh, radio or TV, in general has been unbiased and really trained to present the facts um, rather than, as, as Scott talked about, you know, trying to combat that misinformation, which is
coming through uh, just people like you and me otherwise who are voicing opinions and presenting it as facts. And so I think continually fighting that misinformation has been hard. But in general, the media has been great. Specifically, the media around Kansas City uh, has been excellent for that, you know, working every day diligently to try and present the facts unbiased, uh, following their training and doing that. Um, you know, it also continues to be a mission of education for them. I talked about our mission of education here at uh, University of Kansas Health System. Well, it's the same for journalism, presenting that education, whether it's world topics or coronavirus, whatever that topic may be. And they have done a great job throughout the pandemic. Um, still wanting to get back into studio with Dana and Parks. You know, there are other infections. I can, I'm always happy to come and help as well. But overall, just want to uh, give a big shout out to the media, like I said, in general in, in the nation, but also specifically around Kansas City, because I know uh, the great job that they've done and the effort that they have put into really just presenting the facts for one reason, and that's to keep our community healthy. I was going to say it, but of course you yeah. got to it before. I, this is all a true story. <laughs> the minute we went into Fox for the last two years, when do I get to go back? When do yeah. I get to go back? And so uh, yeah. Matt, Data, Scott, in particular, thank you for giving Dr. Hawkinson that, yes. that daily platform there for a while to be able to you know, live out <laughs> his TV dreams. So thank you so much for that. And thanks to just to our entire panel of journalists for joining us today, your insight, your hard work, your willingness to work with us throughout the pandemic for the good of our community and our states. It was not just appreciated, but it, it simply put, it helped save lives. So we thank you. We thank you. And as always, we thank you all for joining us today. Don't forget, you can catch our shows anytime by logging on to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And we leave you today with a look back at the pandemic from where we sat right here on this desk from the very beginning. Our photographer and editor, Cliff Irwin, put together a recap of our last two years here on the Morning Medical Update. So everyone, we'll see you back here Monday at 8. Have a great weekend. Welcome to our first virtual news conference. I'm Jessica Lovell with the University of Kansas Health System. Our purpose of this press conference today is to answer our questions about uh, protocols for care and for public safety. We've learned a lot, but there's a lot more we need to learn. Avoid putting your hands in your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Sunny says, have your mask ready. Make sure it's comfortable. You'll wear it most of the day. What about uh, giving out candy? How can we do that safely? Staffing is at capacity. This is KU, go ahead. Nobody's more tired of it than we are, um, but we're still here and we're doing it every day. I had one day where I had three people die before 9 a.m. The COVID blizzard continues in Kansas City in the metro area. Every day it's a new record, unfortunately. We know the disease is prevalent throughout the community right now. If you have symptoms and you can't get a test, you need to go forth with an abundance of caution, and that means really to act as if you do have it. And remember that love at the end of the day is still more powerful than anger. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. You know the place and the voice. What this local business owner says you should spend your money on to help stomp out a growing problem. I'm Jessica Lovell. We'll see you Monday at 8 on these social media channels. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.